Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Alazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today we will talk about medical devices, but a special kind of medical devices. It's devices that are a bit linked to drug. So we'll talk today about Article 117, which is an article of the Medical Device Regulation, MDR 2017 745. And I have with me Theresa Giari, which is the Managing Director of Regulatory and Scientific Affairs Limited. Hey, uh, Teresa, welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Hey, Munira, it's great to be uh, invited to speak on your podcast. Thank you, so thank you for that. Us. Thank you for you, because I think you will be really helping us to understand uh, a lot of uh, important information here about the drug side of the medical device uh, regulation, uh, because we have this, uh, this uh, Article 117. But before that, can you just make a small introduction of yourself for the audience, and then we can really uh, go to the topics. Absolutely. So um, I've had quite a varied career. I started my career out in the pharmaceutical industry many years ago as a formulation scientist. Um, before moving in about 2006, I think it was, when I first started working with a medical device manufacturer developing medical devices that contained ancillary medicinal substances, um, from there, I moved on and moved, I suppose, across the fence to work for Notified Bodies. Great. First at BSI for many years as a technical specialist on the, the ancillary medicinal substance side um, before joining LRQA. And I was very privileged and honoured to be um, in the position of head of Notified Body at LRQA um, for, for several years until early last year. Um, so since then, I've been working as a consultant with both pharmaceutical and medical device companies, helping them understand, obviously, the new regulations in the medical device side and, and make sure they're compliant with requirements. No, I think it's great. And it's great that you had this, uh, this experience with notified bodies because uh, we have a topic here also to discuss about a notified body situation for this Article 117, uh, which I think you will give us really a great, uh, a great support to understand what, what people have to do. Uh, yeah, so uh, mainly this, uh, this episode is really uh, linked to um, manu uh, manufacturers that have some medical devices that are also linked to drug, but also drug companies that are using some medical devices uh, and that have to understand now how they can um, submit their dossier because there is a small or I don't know if it's, I can say small, but there is a change, some changes that are happening now due to the medical device regulation. You will never yeah, you will think about that, but the medical device regulation is amending the, uh, the, the medi medicinal uh, directive. So uh, I hope, yeah, the um, drug companies will really understand that and um, yeah, put in place the right things to, to be compliant. But um, first, uh, Theresa, the first thing I want to ask you is, what is this Article 117 that I'm talking about now? What it says exactly? Okay, a, a small article within the medical device really regulation. Small. But as you said, very small, a couple of paragraphs long, but has huge implications for those drug delivery, so those integral drug delivery systems that deliver medicinal products. Now, um, you know, there's no definition of a combination product in, in the EU legislation. So what we have are many combinations, uh, and Article 117 very much impacts those um, products where there is a device that's there to deliver a medicinal product, and it's a single integral use type system. Um, so if you think of maybe um, auto-injector pens for insulin or for adrenaline, those types of, of products are impacted by this. And there are many because obviously as technology is advanced, um, good drug delivery systems really can help the compliance of a, of a medicinal product for patients. So they are quite numerous. And this article came about, I suppose, um, to, to bridge a gap. So there was a perceived gap in the legislation um, prior to the medical device regulation. So the aim of Article 117 was to ensure that the right stakeholders were involved in the assessment process. And as technology has really advanced, um, it probably is appropriate that there's additional scrutiny by experts on the medical device aspects of these types of delivery systems. So we also have combination products, I guess, where you can co-package 
for example, a measuring spoon in with a medicinal product. Yeah. Those are outside of Article 117. However, I, I'm aware that the EMA guideline on the quality guidelines for documentation to be provided, they've gone one step further to Article 117 to provide additional guidance on the expectations for documentation in those aspects. Yeah, there is this there is this FAQ that the EMA wrote uh, to really help the drug companies to understand the impact of Article 117. I would put that also on the show notes for people that are uh, listening here, uh, so that they can see what I, what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, we have here um, two kinds of products. The ones that are combined, like as you've said, the 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 pens uh, or the the, the pre filled syringe or this kind of thing, and you have the other devices that are. Uh, additional um, complementary to a, to a drug, and uh, but they are not really uh, combined specifically uh, to them. But it's mainly what is uh, written on Article 117. They are really discussing both situations, what they should do in case of both situations. But first, the product itself should be considered as a drug, not a medical device. This is uh, the point here. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, uh, as I said, there's no definition of combination product in Europe. So a product will either be regulated as a medicinal product or a, a medical device, depending on its its primary mode of action. So uh, as I said, for, for drug delivery systems, uh, an auto-injector pen for insulin, the insulin has the primary mode of action in those cases. The device is there purely to deliver it. It's a single integral product for single use. And therefore, that product, although it looks like a device uh, to the man on the street, it is regulated as a medicinal product. And it's those products that are impacted by Article 117. Yeah, so uh, it's also what I'm, I'm, I'm saying to many people. So there is really three steps to go first when you are going to define your products. First, is it really a medical device or not? Uh, is it what is the classification and the conformity assessment route? But if the first answer is no, it's not a medical device, then you can already uh, have to look at other uh, regulation about that. But now, what is the difference, if I can say, I mean, now, in the 26th of May 2020, if I can say when the MDR will be applicable, what will be the difference for the drug companies? What they will have to change? Okay, so if a drug company, um, and I suppose that date, I'll use one word of caution, it's unclear at this minute in time. I'm seeing a lot of um, posts on LinkedIn and uh, public media and the European Commission page that they're talking about extending by one year that transition time frame. So yeah. we'll see if that has an impact also, so just keep that in mind. Yeah, this is this is this is uh, just a reminder. So it was announced yesterday, and this is a proposal that will be submitted on beginning of April, uh, and then the Parliament and the Council should approve that. So it's still a proposal. So I'm also warning some some people that are already uh, putting that like uh, it will be uh, uh, live or approved. It's just a proposal, so it can be approved, but it can also not be approved. So continue with your journey, if I can say, to be MDR compliant. Because because yeah. uh, we never know what is happening. It's an administrative action, so we never know when they will approve that and if it will ap be approved or not. So no, you exactly. can stop now, continue your efforts. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, if you have a product in this space, um, if the medical device component is not C marked in its own right, then you are required to obtain a notified body opinion on the device aspects uh, and their compliance to the general safety and performance requirements is detailed in Annex 1 of the medical device regulation. And you're required to get this notified body opinion from obviously a MDR designated notified body who can provide that service. Um, and that's for all new applications after the 26th of May this year. So, you know, timing is very important. Um, I, I guess this is very new. Um, pharmaceutical companies in this space have never needed to engage the services of a notified body uh, and may very well be wondering 
how do I go about this? How do I find these people? Um, and what are they looking for? So those are some of the key questions at this minute in time. And hopefully we can talk through and discuss some, some key points and tips for that. Yeah, no, it's clear. It's clear that uh, the drug companies were more uh, engaged with the um, Ministry of Health or uh, MAH. So um, the... The difference here is a bit huge, if I can say. So uh, as you mentioned, huge. finding yeah. finding the notified body, knowing how to deal with the notified body, understanding really the role of the notified body uh, yeah. is really key for them. Uh, and to be honest, it's not the same as engaging with the, with the Ministry of Health or something like that. It has nothing to Absolutely do with that. Absolutely not. You so, know, a notified body are a service provider. They provide conformity assessment services. Um, Yes, they charge fees for that, um, but they, they're not a regulator in, in, in the same way. They're designated by their, their national competent authority to be able to provide the service in the EU Commission. And you know, as of today, there are 12 notified bodies who are MDR um, designated. Um, and you know, it, it's not clear how many more there will be, and perhaps not all of those designated MDR uh, notified bodies are wanting to either provide the service at this minute in time. I am aware of a few who already do, um, and I know certainly the BSI have already issued and issued out the first notified body opinion for a manufacturer. So, um, yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 the difficulty here for them to understand is the fact that a notified body has a specific products that it can certify uh, or it can engage with. Uh, and there is a list on the Nando database. I will put also that on the on the show notes where you have all the list of notified bodies and which kind of products you can really deal with. But you're right. Maybe your notified bodies will not be also interested really to just provide a, um, a statement or information about um, a kind of a drug device a combination product. Combination. Um, yeah. So it, it can be also difficult for them. But one thing that we are discussing just before uh, hitting record here. So. Um, it's also the difference when you are making an application to a health um, health authority or to a notified body. When you are doing an application to a health authority, you have more like uh, some days, some timelines to say from day zero to day 120, we'll do that. And then we'll have a clock stop and then we'll start again at day uh, and, and then we'll do that. It's just, so it's really kind of um, organized. Is it the notified body? <laughs> <laughs> notified bodies, I can assure you, are organised. However, their timelines do vary between notified bodies. So um, with the medical device regulation imminent and, and them tidying up on the MDD and completing renewals, um, they, they are rather stretched for resource at this minute in time, I would say. So it's worth having that discussion with the, the various notified bodies to understand what their internal procedures are in this because they may differ between notified body and expected timelines. Um, yeah, so each one will be different. It will be case by case. Some devices could be very complex, requiring more than one expert involved in the assessment against the GSPRs. So, for example, if you had something that was electrical and maybe had was driven by software, you might need more than one expert to, to look at the GSPRs and be able to make that opinion and that assessment report for the manufacturer. Um, so it's, it's worth bearing that in mind. It will be case by case. Uh, I think notified bodies who are in this space are definitely trying to, to do the best service possible for everyone. But just be aware in terms of project planning and timelines, um, it won't be like an MRP procedure where you have set time scales and clock, clock stops. Uh, each notified body will have their own internal procedures that they follow to provide the service. But uh, yeah, as, as you mentioned, we have to provide them some clear documentation. And it's not a technical documentation, a full technical documentation. It's mainly, um, or it is, but it's really a short uh, example with specifically the Annex 1. So we talked about the GSPR. Um, mm -hmm. And is there something else that they have to add to that? I would say, you know, it's, it's a form. It's it's probably a shortened STED format technical file uh, and it's how you, how do you demonstrate you know your your GSPR checklist perhaps and how do you demonstrate compliance with the applicable and appropriate GSPRs for your device and that's what the notified body will want to see uh, again 
they can only, they're evidence-based, so they can only look at the information you provide. They will ask questions, undoubtedly. Should you not, or should it not be evident that you have met the uh, GSPRs that you claim to meet through data and through evidence? Scientific data needed, really, uh, and tell the notified body how you've met that GSPR and why you feel you conform with the requirements. Yeah, and uh, for the people that, uh, or drug industry that don't know what are the GSPR, uh, so mainly this is a, a checklist, if I can say, with uh, around 22, uh, if I remember, 22. 22, uh, is, one is 23 on the information and the, the product, product labeling, yeah, details exactly. is 23. So, so yeah. you, have the, you have them really to go one by one and prove that you are complying to each of those requirements and maybe provide also some evidence that you are complying to that. So this is mainly the game that they have to do, to do one by one. There are something that, some things that can be maybe not applicable, so just write not applicable and why. And then the rest you have really to provide which standard you are uh, following, which documents you are do, you're having, which tests you have done to comply to that, etc., etc. So it's really a checklist, and then for each for this checklist, you have really to provide the evidence of it. Correct. Yeah, and you know, I, I think many companies probably work with experts in devices and 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 work with device manufacturers who can support. I'm sure th this sort of approach they will be used to dealing with. Um, these checklists and meeting these essential requirements under the MDD, but they're GSPRs, General Safety and Performance Requirements, under the Medical Device Regulation. So, so now, speak with the experts. Yeah, now that um, I submit that um, uh, the auditor will do an off-site review, I suppose, of all those documentation, um, what they should provide to me to say that I'm fine? Uh, the notified body will issue out a report giving their opinion and through that um, I envisage that to, to give a summary report. Now, remembering in this process that ultimately the competent authority, the medicines agency, make the decision on the product, um, that report needs to be detailed enough to tell the competent authority what the notified body has assessed uh, and if they accept that the GSPR has been met. And why? So it will provide a nice summary statement as to, you know, the assessment that the notified body have conducted on that technical documentation uh, and if everything is satisfactory. If there's any issues, I'm sure there'll be open points raised or points within that report identifying any issues they've seen within the data or anything that they don't uh, feel is appropriate. So, so are, you, are you submitting that with your um, marketing um, authorization application or what, what, how you are putting the, that document? Or I just put it all together. Yes, you are required. If, if your device is not C marked or um, if it's a higher risk classification um, than a, a, a one sterile, then you will get that opinion from a notified body and submit that as part of your marketing authorization application package of information. If you have got a CE mark, uh, what you'll be submitting is your declaration of conformity from the device manufacturer saying that you, you meet requirements and a copy of the, um, the, the CE certificate from an EU notified body for the device. So that, that, those are the options really and that's what Article 117 uh, really speaks about. It gives manufacturers those options in terms of what they have to submit. No, it's clear. I think uh, this is really um, the, the recipe, if I can say, of how what they should do exactly. Um, there is, uh, as I said, a new a new way for them to execute now. Um, can this, do you think this can also impact their timelines if they are not doing that correctly or doing that correctly from, for, yeah, from the beginning? Yes, um, and even, I suppose, I have come across cases where more questions are being asked by competent authorities, even on you know, currently, currently marketed medicinal products that have this device component, uh, and asking manufacturers, do they meet the essential requirements of Annex 1 of the Medical Device Directive, and have they thought about that? So I'm aware of renewals um, having happened in, in sort of the, the latter part of 2019, um, being asked rather difficult questions around compliance to the essential requirements. And this was always written within the Medical Devices Directive as well. 
So Article 117, while it feels new, I think companies have been probably doing it for many years and been aware that the device part still needed to meet Annex 1 of, of the directive and now moving forward much more prescriptively described. But I imagine that maybe some, because as I've said, this is really the medical device regulation, some drug companies will not really look at the medical device regulation and maybe will move forward on their project. Um, yeah, absolutely. And that was always, I guess, a concern I had because it was written in the medical device directive or it's written in a regulation. If you're a, a very traditional drug company, you really don't have the awareness of the, the different regulations, directives. Uh, that can impact on your product. So it is about talking to the right people and making sure if you're in this development space that you, you really are engaging with, with the right stakeholders to make sure your project works as smoothly as possible. Yeah, so engage with consultants that are really knowledgeable on uh, combination products or medical devices so that they can really help you. Um, there is another part of the drug companies um, that uh, are also using some in vitro diagnostic product, which is also um, some products that are within the IVDR, which is not the MDR, but IVDR 2017-746. Um, mm -hmm. that will be, it will be in place normally 2022. Uh, so... Do you see also some of those companies that will be impacted by that or that are not really aware of what is coming with this new uh, in vitro diagnostic um, um, regulation? And I guess there you're probably talking about the um, companion diagnostic exactly. space. Yeah, absolutely. That um, does have huge implications. And I, I think um, just even the huge changes in the IVD regulations as opposed to the IVD directive, Um, you know, I, I suspect there are many IVD manufacturers who don't fully appreciate the impacts of the regulation on them at this minute in time. Yeah. Uh, certainly in the companion diagnostic space, there's a, there is also a consultation that needs to happen um, between the notified body who will certify the uh, IVD uh, along with the um, uh, drug competent authority who has knowledge of the um, companion diagnostic the medicinal product. Uh, component of the companion diagnostic. So uh, as you can see, the regulations are encouraging more um, discussion and sharing of knowledge between key stakeholders, which is appropriate and will hopefully, uh, I'm sure, improve patient safety ultimately for everyone. So it's about that knowledge sharing. Article 117 and notified body opinions, I see that maybe as the reverse of what I had done in my career at the Notified Body for many years, where I would, for a device with ancillary medicinal substance, go and seek the opinion from a drug competent authority on the, the drug aspects. Mm. So I see this as being the reverse of that and something that works very well. Maybe maybe at the beginning we all, we all spoke to each other and looked at each other and wondered how this would work, but a process was in place and there's many good competent authorities who provide that service to notified bodies. So maybe uh, as I, I try to always look on the bright side of life, um, look at it that, that there is precedence for this cross sharing and communication between the various stakeholders involved in the product uh, and that these things can work very, very well. I think we need to be pragmatic at this minute in time and I hear that echoed by EMA who are issuing the guidance, um, you know, and it will be a learning phase for now. So that's where I hope the pragmatism will come in, that, that as, as everyone learns this new process of getting notified body opinions, um, that, that the competent authorities, the drug competent authorities, the European Medicines Agency, will allow this all time to settle in for everyone to learn and work through and gain and, and, and use to the best of their advantage, um, good processes and procedures, and it will improve with time. So everyone yeah. is learning at the minute, but it, exactly. it will work. Exactly. Will so work. one last point maybe to, to cover here is um, after the approval. So we, do you think there will be still some, um, some connections or some discussion with notified bodies for drug companies? So is there some kind of um, um, action that they should continue to do for the products Uh, for the medical device part maybe and communicate to the notified body or just the approval and statement is sufficient and then they can move forward for 30 years without talking to them? 
Uh, no, that, that isn't really life, is it? Um, <laughs> so notified bodies who provide these opinions, should a manufacturer really make significant changes to the device that can have an impact on those GSPRs, or they've had to gather new evidence to support they still meet a GSPR because of a change, then it's you know there will be this sort of continued and review process of those and a, a new opinion would need to be issued. Um, certainly I know the EMA guidelines sort of have foreseen these platform technologies trying to be as pragmatic as possible but really in terms of changes those are a little bit more concerning for people. How do you manage them and how, how do you um, decide if something is significant or not. So I do expect to see a lot more thought put into the, the handling of changes, but I would expect, and a notified body who's conducted an opinion, uh, doesn't expect that opinion to, to last forever, should you be making really significant changes to the device design, um, then you, you as a company really should be going back to the notified body who provided the original opinion. Uh, to, to update them and to get a new opinion to support the changes. And I suppose the notified body will not come like for medical device company every year to audit you on site and everything. So it's not something that they, they, they no, will No, this, this is something I was, I, I have been very vocal on this, that many things, and I know the originally, I was horrified to hear of notified bodies turning up to uh, do quality management systems audits. That's not the spirit of Article 117. Article 117 is very much about just ensuring an opinion of the technical information is provided uh, by a notified body. And, and that's appropriate for this because they are regulated as medicinal products, ultimately. Uh, yeah. And yeah. yeah. No, it's great. It's up for the, yeah, absolutely. For the pharmaceutical company to make sure whoever is providing their device that they have uh, an appropriate level of a quality management system in place for that. No, I think it's really helpful, I think, for, for the audience and for, for people that are listening to here to, to, to understand exactly what they should do and what will happen after they have done it also and, uh, and the support also of Notified Body. As I said, really, the struggle that maybe they can have now is uh, to find a Notified Body. I have a lot of manufacturers that are medical device manufacturers that struggle to find a Notified Body. So I imagine it would be more a struggle for, for drug companies because uh, it will not be a long-term engagement with notified bodies, with just a, a one shot, if I can say. Uh, so then uh, it's maybe not really something interesting for, for notified bodies, but, uh, but we'll see. Um, in terms of you, um, as you said, you are a consultant and you are working uh, to help uh, customers. So what, what are your services and what you can do exactly to support them? Currently, I provide services in regulatory strategy and support. Um, coming from the notified body background, I at least understand and speak the same language, if you like, as, no, as notified bodies, uh, and I can, I can help companies be put in touch with um, notified bodies who can provide this service and can support customers in this way. So uh, that's the, the sort of service I can provide. Yeah, and this is important for a drug company because I was working with some drug companies and they were saying to me, oh, can we submit that for a uh, review? I, can, I can't remember what is the term that you are using in the drug uh, side, but it's more like uh, a review or, or information, like a, a preliminary review by, by the authorities before to really submit the dossier. And in notified bodies, it's not working like that. It's uh, when you have finished, you have to submit, and they are not doing some kind of advising or providing some support. Absolutely, yeah. Is, yeah. Notified bodies don't consult or provide consultancy services. Absolutely not. When you go to a notified body, you are basically telling them we meet requirements, uh, and and you know they are then just conducting their assessments to to challenge whether or not you've met those requirements, but. But when you make application, you're already decided as a company and an organization that you've met requirements and you have all the documentation to demonstrate that. So notified bodies are very different from, from regulators. Um, but certainly, you know, their sales teams are, are open to discussion and potential applications. Uh, but just be aware they won't be giving you advice on what they expect to see. You're the expert in terms of the, the application you make. 
It was, it was not like that before. I remember that a time when I was starting my career, it was more like a collaboration with Notified Body and we are really talking together and it's more like giving me some advice on how I can improve myself, etc. And it really changed at one point to say, no, we are not really giving any advice anymore. We are not a consulting agency, etc. And it is kind of a requirement by the authorities. The authorities are mainly mentioning that you are here to certify them. You are not here to make a friend friend with them and, and give them some kind of opinion or uh, help them to improve. It's not your job. It's the job of a consultant. You are here just to certify them. This is mainly the... the, the yeah, the and it's, you know, have. to be very impartial and, to, you know, the job of the notified body, you need to be impartial to be able to do the job. You need to be uh, black and white, what the requirements are, have they satisfied requirements, yes or no, uh, is really what a notified body can do and say. Yeah. yeah, no, it's clear. So, uh, Theresa, just a the last point. So, you prepare the document also for, for the for the audience, so the, that they can they, they can download that. Uh, so, what is included inside exactly? Just some very top level guidance on how to engage with a notified body. Uh, just a summary as well of what Article One One Seven is about, and pointers to guidance documents such as the uh, the EMA guideline on quality um, applications. Um, uh, and just a, yeah, a brief summary and, of course, my contact details as well. No problem. So, yeah, for the people in the audience, so please uh, go on the show notes and just download the documents from uh, Theresa Giari um, so that you can get really a summary of the discussion that we had today uh, and that you can also get her contact details if you need any more information or if you have any more questions, you can directly contact, uh, contact her. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that, Theresa. I hope you will be helpful for them. Okay, for the audience that are uh, just listening, so thank you for, for all your support. Uh, thank you also for all the comments that you are providing on the YouTube channel or on the, on the uh, podcast uh, website. I uh, really appreciated that. Uh, it's, uh, don't hesitate also to put also some comments in terms of uh, the topics that you want uh, us to cover here. I will try to find the expert that will help you and uh, really uh, with the objective to, uh, to serve you and to provide you a lot of value. Um, okay, so Theresa, so thank you really for your help. Thank you for all the support you are providing. Uh, and uh, yeah, people don't hesitate to contact Theresa directly, even on LinkedIn. I can also put your LinkedIn details on the show notes so that people can also ask, ask you questions. So thank you, Theresa, for your support and I wish you a nice day. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you today. Take thank care. You. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.